Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out on this beautiful day to celebrate Cassandra's new book. Um, I just want to, before we get started, acknowledge that we gather as guests on the unceded traditional lands of the Duwamish people who have lived in and have been caretakers of the land here since time and memorial. We thank the people of the Coast Salish tribes for their stewardship, and we strive to nurture our relationships with indigenous peoples of the Northwest by joining their efforts to work for social justice and to care for this land. Moderating tonight's conversation, the fabulous Joy McCullough is the author of many acclaimed books for youngsters, middle grade readers, and young adults, including her debut, Blood Water Paint, which won the Washington State and Pacific Northwest Book Awards, as well as being lauded in many, many ways. <laughs> she writes books and plays from her home in the Seattle area where she lives with her husband and two children. She studied theater at Northwestern University, fell in love with her husband atop of Guatemalan Volcano, a story I would love to hear, uh, <laughs> and now spends her days with the three best things, kids, dogs, and books. Middle reader book, Code Red, will be out on June 13th, so please keep your eyes out. This is fabulous. Cassandra, 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 Cassandra Newbold is the editor and a contributor of the YA intersectional fat feminist anthology, Every Body Shines. As host and creator of the Fat Like Me podcast, Cassandra has lived, or rather, has discussed the need for more intersectional body diversity in kid food. She lives in the Pacific Northwest with her family. When she's not writing, you can find her at a poker table. Reminding the other players to never underestimate the power of a determined girl and her cards. <laughs> so you guys better keep your eyes out. She looks like a shark. <laughs> Things I'll Never Say is her debut contemporary YA novel. Tonight. <laughs> Yay! Thank you. Thank you so much. Yay! Yes! And thank you all for being here. I'm so excited to get to celebrate with Cass and hello to the people who might be streaming with us. Um, we were just saying before that the last time we saw each other, we were at a writer's retreat together in we think 2019. We know it was pre-pandemic. Yes. Um, and yeah, so it has been a long time. And even before that, we knew each other online in the Seattle YA writer arena. Um, so I know some of your journey to publication story in broad strokes, um, but, I, but I don't know it in the details. Um, I do know that it wasn't straight and direct and easy, uh, <laughs> nor was mine. And I don't know how many, so how many people here are writers? Anybody, whether you're published or not? Yeah, just a couple. Um, but, and then how many people are here because you love cats? and or books okay <laughs> so for those of you who are not necessarily in the publishing realm it is it is very common for it to be a longer more winding path to publication than you might guess very few people write a book and then it gets published uh mine i wrote nine novels that did not get published before i wrote what became my debut um and i think your journey was a, a little bit windy too can we talk a little bit about how you went from starting to write, whenever that was, to debut novel? Yeah, definitely. First, I want to say this is really cool that I'm doing this with you because the first uh, book launch that I ever went to was Bloodwater Paint. Oh, wow. Here. It was here, yeah. 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 When they were upstairs. Yeah. yeah, and that's when I was still just dreaming about being a writer and hadn't even gotten an agent yet. So it Amazing. feels full circle right now. Um, but yeah, uh, I got into a really bad accident in uh, 2010. I was walking across the street, got hit by a van, and my whole body was just destroyed. And it was uh, years plus long recovery. And during that time, I had a lot of downtime because I couldn't really leave my house. And so my kids encouraged me that because I used to tell them stories all the time um, to maybe write some of them down. And so I started playing around writing for fun and um, I just found the writing community online which was a savior in itself because again I wasn't really going out and doing too much at the time 
Um, it revolved around physical therapy, very much. And um, I entered pitch contests. And <laughs> uh, I suggest nobody do this if you are a writer, but I entered a pitch contest with first draft. And ended up getting signed by an agent with it. <laughs> and that, that is very unheard of. Yeah, yeah. And I know now how ridiculous that was of me to try that. But I did it with, at the time, one of the top agencies um, in the business. So I was just like, okay, this is my chance. Everything's going to happen. It's in. And that's okay. Um, afterwards, I parted ways with that agent. And I wrote... Um, in middle grade and while I was writing middle grade I started my podcast and as I was doing my podcast I started talking to other authors um, editors agents entertainers all about the need for intersectional uh, body diversity in all forms of media and really positive representation of people all across the board because it's lacking everywhere and as I was talking to everyone I really felt inspired to do an anthology. And so I started querying again. I got an agent. We sold the um, anthology within like two months. And I was just like, yes, this is my time. And so I started working again on my middle grade novel, which I put away for a while. Um, and then things happened and I parted ways with my other agent and it was the holidays. Um, I left her in October. I pulled myself together through the holidays and in January I decided, and that was January of um, last year. It's so strange. Last year I queried Ernie, my agent, Ernie Chiara and um, with Fuse Literary and um, <laughs> I queried him in January. Uh, we worked on my book for a month. We went, uh, uh, or uh, he he offered representation. We worked on my book for a month. He went on sub and we sold it in March. And oh my gosh, so, yeah. that's super fast. <laughs> yeah, and so fast forward to now, only a year and like three months later, and here I am looking at my book. It was a whirlwind. It was, and I sold it to Ashley Hearn at Peachtree Team. Or Peach Tree Team. And um, they've been absolutely amazing. My, my entire publication team is awesome. That's fantastic. And I feel like um, Ernie was a Pitch Wars mentor, and yes. Ashley was also a Pitch yes. Wars mentor, and I was a bit, and you were all, that was a, that's a fun connection. Yeah, it really is. And uh, it just has been a blast, both to have Ernie as my agent and Ashley as my editor. They really make you feel like you're part of a team. They're an amazing like cheerleader champion of your work and you don't ever feel like you're hanging or lost. And that's really vital when you're writing because um, you can get lost really fast. It's so important. It's a really difficult, strange industry that runs in uh, bizarre ways. So having somebody that you can trust to, to guide you through it is super important. Yeah. So I'm so glad you found yeah. that. Yeah. I think it's, I was thinking about your debut um and how it's not the first book it's not the second you know there were a few books there that weren't the right book to start with and and that was true of my journey too um and then the book i did end up debuting with was a deeply personal book um and that's the way it was supposed to be and as i was reading this i was thinking about what uh just beating heart of a book it is and I don't know enough of your personal story to know how much of it comes from you or people you love but there's obviously a lot there that is very personal to you and um I think sometimes it's just the universe is waiting for the right book and the right time and all those things to come together yeah. and it feels like this might have been that for you yeah I think so um when I was a teenager, I was really, I, I was a teenager in the mid nineties and Same. I was really <laughs> into the rape scene. I grew up in Southern Florida at the time and that was a very huge community. Um, unfortunately, while I found some of my very, very best friends and had an amazing time, there was also a lot of downfalls. One is the extreme use of drugs and how many people turned into addicts in that community. And unfortunately, 
people I absolutely loved so much passed away before the age of 20 and continuing on even now. Um, you know, I find out that some of my friends have passed away and like to continuously go through that loss. My boyfriend died when I was 19 years old, the day before he was supposed to move out to Las Vegas. He had an overdose and died. Um, when he was my, I had moved out to Las Vegas like a month before that and he was going to follow me and he passed away. And so I ended up having to go home for his funeral. Um, and just losing some of my very, very best friends within a short time span. And I, as I grew older, I had a very weird aversion to death, just processing it, um, not being able to talk about it to people, not, not like closing down when someone else I had passed away, not going to funerals. And I realized society doesn't really teach people how to grieve and yet it's a universal experience if you're born you're going to die and if you have anyone <laughs> regardless if they're friends family acquaintances co-workers you're going to know someone else who's going to die too because we all do um but nobody prepares you for that and most of the time they allow it for a couple of weeks a couple of months and then they expect you to move on and they expect you to be normal and they expect you to hide your feelings. And because of that, I think there's a lot of um, emotions that we just shove down the side and we pretend we're okay. And then it comes out when you're watching your commercial and you sob for no reason. Or like, you know, you're, you hear a song and all of a sudden you're just so angry because that person isn't there to talk about it. Or they just a flashback and it makes you laugh so hard because you remember a funny conversation that you had about something, something stupid. And like, it's just those moments that you realize your entire life you dream of people that you lose because you love them so much. And I wanted to write a book that tells people no matter what stage of grief you're in, that's the exact stage of grief that is okay for you. You're, you're allowed to be angry forever. You're allowed to be sad forever. Um, you're allowed to be happy about it. You know, like uh, the more that you remember the good times, it's okay to feel happiness in those moments. And you shouldn't feel guilty for feeling happy about the things that you remember. And um, especially teens with the way the world is right now between the pandemic, the shootings, the just all different types of violence. And, and like, it's a tough time to be a young adult and I want to give them a safe space to know that it's okay to not be okay. Yeah. I think that's incredible. And it comes across so clearly um, in, in the book, the main character has lost their twin brother to a drug overdose. And that's in the very beginning. That's not a spoiler. Um, and, and the book is structured as these journals that she's writing as letters to this brother who has died. And there's this wonderful um, thing that you've created where she's writing these journals and then she's burning them. And that, and that also happens early on, um, which is such a wonderful way to process that grief. That I'd love if you could talk about coming up with that and how you decided to go with that. Yeah, well, when I... I've never written an epistle or anything. <laughs> That's <laughs> and, a book in letters. <laughs> yeah, and, and I didn't know that I was going to write it in that format, but it just felt like but the entire time my main character is talking to her twin who passed away before the starts. It's about 18 months after he's passed away. And she's experiencing a moment that she doesn't know how to deal with without him. And so she needs to talk to him. And every month since he's died, um, he, she writes him a journal. Uh, there's been a couple of times when she hasn't had the power to be able to do that. But this particular journal is the catalyst of the most important thing in her life since he's been gone. Because she's fallen in love with her two best friends, who also happen to be his two best friends. And they call themselves the Star Squad. And so they're all grieving. She doesn't know what to do. She doesn't have anyone to talk to. She can't talk to them about it yet until she figures out her feelings. And so she writes it. And when she finishes a journal, they all get together. The journal's private to her, but they all write to them. They get together and they burn the journal in the hopes that the ashes fly up into the universe and he's able to 
feel them somehow, that they reach, the ashes reaches his stardust. And it's just her way of really feeling like she's communicating with him, even though she can't hear back from him. It's all the things she'll never say out loud. Um, and so um, I just felt like that was a way that we could still incorporate him the entire time. Mm -hmm. And also, like, you're, you're sort of living past moments. There's a lot of going back into her life and seeing moments where he exists. And that would have been impossible unless I wrote an entire book of flashbacks, you know? <laughs> and so it just sort of really fit with that. And I think that just the idea of putting all of your emotions into a safe space and then setting them free sort of is a feeling of rebirth every single time. And I was thinking about, uh, you mentioned the pandemic, and I was thinking about how so many teens, even if they didn't lose to COVID, lost so many things over the last several years that they can, everyone can relate to, to loss and grief in some way. Um, and I was thinking, what a wonderful gift you've given. Like, I can imagine so many readers will read this and, and decide to do exactly that, to, to write journals or letters or whatever, and, and for a, a catharsis and sort of a processing. Um, I think that there's so much more support for mental health than when we were teenagers. So yeah. hopefully that is a, a, a hopeful, positive thing um, in the world of, of addiction and stuff. I don't know about the numbers if they're down from the 90s. I hope they are. Um, but books aren't, aren't a, a substitute for therapy. Uh, but I think that they can be a really wonderful place for teenagers to safely explore ideas and realize, oh, here's a character who's experiencing something like I am. And, oh, here's how she's dealing with it. Maybe I can find help too. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like there's, there's a lot that's really raw and painful, but I think that that's really helpful in it too. Yeah, I tried to balance it because even when you're, I think sometimes in your darkest moments, that's when you find the most unusual light. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, I think that I try to balance that in the story. There's moments where you just feel like Casey, her name's Casey Jones Crusoe, and you feel like Casey Jones is just falling apart and is never going to uh, ever stand back up. But then there's just this little tiny grain of sand where she finds something that all of a sudden she's just like talking crap to her brother in the middle of a big rant, you know, and like it cheers her up or, you know, just the memory of something gentle. And I think that therapy, whether you're seeking it from outside sources or just working on it internally, it's really processing everything. And uh, definitely, like you said, um, especially right now, I'm so happy that it's not as stigmatized mm -hmm. um, right. because I feel like as an entire world, we need it a lot more. And it, it, I, it's nice to have the idea that generations below us will feel more comfortable getting it and through all different outlets. And if they get a little bit of therapy through reading my book and, and being able to um, recognize things in themselves, then that's a bonus. Yeah. And another thing that, that teenagers might recognize in themselves is that Casey is bi. Um, and she's sort of already realized that at the beginning of the book, but she hasn't articulated it to, to her friends. Um, but in addition to that, she is crushing on, I believe is, is the, the way she says it, both Frankie and Ben, this the guy best friend and the girl best friend. Um, and, and simultaneously, and there ends up being a lot of, of thought and discussion around non-monogamy. Um, and that there isn't very much in YA. I'm really interested. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, did you set out to do that or did that happen as you were writing? It sort of happened organically. Um, I, I always wonder how often people are actually developing crushes on the people that they're closest to, whether they act on them or not. When you're around somebody all the time, it just sort of feels natural to crush on them. And sometimes those crush, 
crushes blossom into relationships. Sometimes they fizzle into nothing. Sometimes it's unrequited love. You know, there's just so many different variances of ways to care about the person. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, you know, YA is sort of famous for love triangles. <laughs> and so I thought I wanted to just do my own spin on it and make it a by infinity where, <laughs> where, you know, instead of just being a triangle where someone's feelings get hurt and someone has to choose and the other, you know, and it's friends and drama and breakup. I, there's a lot of drama and breakup. I wanted to find a story where they did it in a healthy, uh, safe relationship where it was okay to date multiple people and you when you're 18 19 50 you don't have to stay in just one solid relationship to have a healthy relationship and to have an open relationship to have you know a non-monogamous relationship where people trust each other and they talk about things and they're not cheating on each other and they're not hiding anything and just exploring life like it, it felt like a story that needed a, a voice in the shuffle alongside all of the rest. Yeah, absolutely. I was talking to my teenager who reads a lot, and we were trying to think, and she knew that Iron Widow has um, that. And there's a book by Catherine Locke um, called This Rebel Heart, which also does that's historical and fantasy. So are there others? Because I was thinking this is the only why a contemporary Those, I could think of. Yeah, no, I, I really haven't found it. It's your trailblazer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I hope we can do it okay. <laughs> you guys the chance to do it better than me. So I'm curious um, about your writing process. How much um, do you plan ahead or let things unfold? <sighs> I'm a cancer. It's an awful, awful trait. <laughs> okay, so for people who don't know these terms, um, writers talk in terms of being plotters or pantsers. Plotters being people who plot, who have planned out, outlined ahead of time. Pantsers is uh, refers to by the seat of your pants, sort of just <laughs> sitting down to write and figuring it out as you go along. So you're a pantser. I am. I'm a pantser who edits as I write, so I don't even know if that's a different train wreck or not. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't move forward until I fix what's behind me, and so maybe that's why my first draft got an agent because I polish uh -huh. as I go. Um, like, but I, I, you know, I don't really turn in a zero draft. Like, I try and make it as complete as possible, um, and I just I find. I'm a terrible daydreamer with the attention span of an ant. And so <laughs> I find if I put too much thought ahead of time, I my inspiration will, will fizzle. My imagination sort of shrinks away to nothing. But if I just sit there and not think about anything at all and start typing, my brain just sort of goes on auto drive. And I really don't even know what I'm thinking about or what I'm typing until I reread what I've put down. Like, I don't know. I know that's about what I start You start with. with a title? I start with a title. You started with a title of this mm -hmm. one? Oh yeah. my gosh. Yeah, that's how that's I start. fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> so they didn't make you change, this was the title you titled it? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times in publishing, they make you change your title. The authors often are overruled on title. Yeah, I, I literally based my story around the title. <laughs> Oh, wow. I don't know if I've ever heard anyone does that. <laughs> You're trailblazing in another way. <laughs> Did you do that with the anthology, too? Uh -huh. Well, no. To be fair, I had um, a different name for the anthology that I was uh, It happens. <laughs> it does, yes, yes. It's still a great title. Yeah. I, I love that title. But Oh, that's fascinating. Okay, so I'm interested if you're a pantser entirely, then. Are you, um, have you worked under like are you writing the next book is it do you have an option book that you're doing now under a, i just turned in my option book so, so how did that work because it can be different when you're a pantser who just writes how the wind blows you but then when you suddenly you have a contract for the next book you don't have the time and space necessarily to do that and so i have talked to other writer friends who suddenly with the second book it's like oh my gosh wait i have to totally change how i write 
were you able to or well um so right now all i've turned in is like the first four or five chapters okay. and i wrote the chapters then i wrote a little of what the book may become <laughs> right. I said, well, okay, this, that, and that has happened, and maybe this is how it'll end. And even as I was writing it to my editor, I said, but this could be entirely just absolutely nothing that happens. But bear with me, because then this could happen. And I probably sounded like I was just rambling, but I think she knows my style of writing and trusts me by now. Yeah. That she sees, like, sort of where my brain is working. And, um, and so, but I, I'm just so jazzed about this next project that I, I can really picture it in my head. I don't normally do. Um, and so that's interesting because of the fact that I've had to think about it. It makes me really see farther in, I still won't write it down, but I see the story in my head and like from beginning to end now, sort of, and, and it could change, but yeah, it's a different way of looking at it. Sure, the synopsis are awful. <laughs> but I think the main thing to remember, because a lot of times people who are pantsers will say, I can never outline, I can never do a synopsis because then I would lose the creativity and imagination of coming up with it in the moment. But I think the the key is to know that nothing is set in stone un yeah. until it's a printed book. Yeah. Like, and editors understand that. Yeah. And you can turn in a synopsis, and then when you get into it, realize, oh, this is not it at all, or it's going to veer off in this direction, or whatever. Oh, and sure. they're just going to want what's best for the book most of the time. Yeah. Um, sometimes I think it can be tricky, like if you're writing a series or something, and then you have to but I've never done that. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know yeah. how to that. Yeah, no, and, and that's true. And that's another thing, like when you're an author, you really have to learn to be able to let things go. If it's not mm -hmm. working for your book, let it go. And it's okay to kill off ideas, people, um, <laughs> <laughs> figuratively. Characters. <laughs> no, figuratively. <laughs> Characters. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, it's really... You can't get too attached and you have to not be attached at all. But once it hits the shelves, it's not yours anymore. It's everybody else's and their take from it is theirs. It's not for you to interfere with how somebody reads your writing. You know? That's such a healthy perspective, especially as a debut. I wonder if because you're kind of a you are a debut, mm -hmm. but you as you saying that makes me think you probably don't read reader reviews. I try not to. Yeah, I try not to. I almost never do. But did you learn that? Did you learn oh, the I lessons? I learned the hard way. <laughs> yeah. 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 When, you, when you write a book about the things that I, you know, incorporated yeah. into our anthology. And the things that you've incorporated into oh, this I'm book sure. too, I'm sure. I am sure. <laughs> I'm going to get some interesting thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, like, I learned, like, <laughs> one person said, everybody in this book is fat. <laughs> and they gave it a one start for it. And I was like, well, <laughs> yeah, that's just facts. That's yeah, in the I description. Mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, like, that's a, a, the timeline pretty much. But, you know, and then that, that was because there were some that, like, hurt my feelings. And then when I read that one, I was like, oh, this doesn't hurt my feelings anymore. Like, it really is just not my place to invade anyone else's thoughts. And and this is their safe space for putting it out there in the world. And they're entitled to it. If they read my book, that's awesome. What they take from it, that's their journey. So it's really helped my just everything, not not taking it personally. Yeah. I think that any artist, I believe, or any profession, really, if you put your heart into something, you take it personally if somebody doesn't like what you've done. And it's hard to say that, but when you can, it's free. 